Welcome to 3 PNR. I'm your host, Adam R. And joining me today is Kevin Briggs. Kevin, how you doing, sir? I'm fine. How are you, Adam? I'm doing well. Uh, here in Florida, we're going to hit the 40s. That's cold for us, so not looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in Florida, too. I'm in the uh, uh, next cloud. Yeah, I'm over here in the, the Clearwater area, close to Tampa. Oh, oh okay. About yeah. an hour or so from me. Yeah, not far. So, Kevin, let's talk about this. Let's get you ta- speaking about who you are, your background, and where you, how you got to where you are today. That's a long story. I'm ready for <laughs> how it. Long have you got, how <laughs> long do you have? I'm, uh, I'm 68 now, Adam, and uh, I've had a varied careers. I, uh, I was brought up in the UK. Uh, I left school. I got a job at uh, the University of Leeds as a technician. I was there for a number of years, 10 or 11 years. Uh, I enjoyed it, worked in the different departments and things. And then I left there and joined the police force in the UK, West Yorkshire Police. So I was a police officer for 20 years. And then I retired from the police force in the UK. My wife wanted to come to the US. We picked on uh, Florida because of the weather. And uh, we came over here, set up a business in real estate. And uh, been selling real estate now for over 20 years. uh, And I still continue to do that. And then um, a few years ago, I was asked, uh, I'm a very spirit- spiritual person, and I've had contact with the higher conscious beings from, from childhood. And uh, probably about five years ago now, I uh, two of the beings that I've been in contact with all my life, I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. There was a bright light outside the window. The light came in through the window, lit up the bedroom like a myriad of butterflies, which is pure white light. And then the two are higher conscious beings, R and D, materialized at the bottom of the bed. Uh, nothing unusual for me. I say I've had contact with them all my life. I, after pleasantries, I asked what was the reason for their visit. And they said they wanted me to talk about my uh, lifelong uh, interaction with them and write about it as well. I said that uh, I don't mind talking about it, but I'm not a writer. I said, well, uh, we'll continue to guide you. We will continue to teach you. And we'll give you information to include in the books, which they have done. Uh, so that's really a quick uh, zoom in, really, I suppose. It's such a long life and such a bad life, three different areas. And now, as I say, right, I've got a book I've just written. and has it published yet, but I'm going to have that published hopefully early next year. Uh, so, yeah, that's where I am now. So I'm from a technician to a police officer to a real estate agent to an author and uh, uh, quite varied journeys, really. But I always had that contact with the higher conscious beings. And my first book is called Spiritual Consciousness, A Personal Journey. And it, it lays out my contact uh, from a very early age. How old were you when that started? I was actually three years old when the journey began. Uh, my mother uh, engaged a photographer to uh, take some photos for the family album. And uh, the photo- photographer arrived. I was lifted up onto the dining room table uh, so you could get a better shot, I think. And, and from that position, I realized I, my conscious energy uh, was in a physical body again. And I was looking out from this physical body around the room from that higher elevation. So uh, that, quite a, uh, an eye opener for me as a young child to realize that, you know, we do travel and we do come back into the physical uh, time after time if we choose to. And I remember that was my first memory of this particular journey. You know, it's interesting because I'd spoken to Steve Murr and a number of other people of contact, and I'm starting to find there's a lot of parallels. One in particular is uh, these beings operate on frequencies that we can't, most people can't perceive, um, which makes sense in your case that they materialize. Because if you look at the even the UFO phenomena, the way they operate, it would appear to me that they, obviously they're not using propulsion. They're utilizing some sort of like a frequency or a vibration. They're, they're transversing space time in, in, in before our eyes. So the beings that, that are communicating with you that want to have you, you know, speak about and perhaps write about uh, their message or the message they want to convey. It, it's, it's, it falls into a category where it, it's, uh, like you said, a supreme mind versus what we're, we're kind of primitive in mind. I mean, we, we this is a perfect thing to witness uh, with the Ukraine and Russia. We're, it's a very primitive mindset we have as far as nations. 
So for you, when you're saying that they're materializing and the way they're communicating with you, it does sound to me like they operate at different frequencies. It sounds sound about right. Uh, oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. The, uh, um, the whole universe is based on frequencies and there are different li- levels of life within those frequencies. They did tell me that uh, uh, the difference between the dimensions are only the frequencies that, they're, that, they, that they exist at. So we down here in the third dimension are lower vibrational frequencies and our sensors, our sight, our hearing, uh, the limited sensors that we have, uh, allow us to live in this dimension, uh, experiencing the physical as we see it. Uh, and they live on, on the, in the fifth dimension, and that's just a higher frequencies. But our sensors are not adapted for seeing and hearing uh, at those higher frequencies. However, as, when I was a child, I was always aware if someone came into the room, uh, and I could feel the change in the frequency within the room. And I suspect many of us have this, but we don't develop it as a child because it always seems to be quashed and it's your imagination. Just like my mother said to me when Orton D materialized in the bathroom when I was eight, she said it was my imagination. Clearly it wasn't. Well, yeah. I mean, as a child, we're, we're sponges. We're absorbing information. We're learning. We're printing. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have experienced, tell me that they, uh, their experiences started at age two, three, four, and a lot of people, uh, naysayers, want to say, well, that's not possible to remember that. Well, it very it is. That's a profound effect on the psyche, regardless of the age. And when you have such a profound effect on you as, as a child, uh, it's a bit of a print upon you. So it becomes, for you in, in your case, as you grow older, you start recognizing what they are. And it's, it's not even a fear base, right? Because upon the visitations, you're not feeling any sort of fear, right? It's uh, You have an understanding. Yes, yes. There's no fear involved at all. I just see them as my extended family. Uh, just instead of coming from the next town, the next city, the next country, they just come from a higher dimensional frequency, which is, with Orton D's case, the fifth dimension. Uh, but I think they've uh, they've assisted the main thread of their uh, education, and it has been an education throughout my life, and it continues to this day, is one of consciousness and how conscious energy can be used for communication, for travel, for healing, for education, for creation and co-creation. And, and all the modalities that they use for uh, contact uh, with me, they've taught me. Uh, and I, I can communicate at their level, uh, at my will, or at their will, because they've educated me to that level of understanding, uh, which is, uh, uh, and I think we, I'm no different from anybody else. I think we all have these abilities. They're just uh, kept hidden from us, and we're not allowed to develop them because our culture doesn't allow it. Uh, so hopefully this is going to change, but we need to change because we need to evolve as a species. And if we're going to become a, a, a true galactic species, then we need to advance in our education and understanding of consciousness so we, we can all communicate with uh, the higher consciousness. I agree with you. Um, something you said about us evolving as a species in particular, because uh, for us, if we want to survive... Uh, survive ourselves that is we have to start looking at one another as a species rather than you know a a race or a religion or a politician you know the ideologies that separate us um there's a lot of parallels with frequencies and and vibration across the board uh in ufology in the paranormal and in more importantly in science Uh, we're as you said we're learning more about the universe and and different uh, star systems and different galaxies and vibration and frequency seem to play a key role in all of it. So Uh, it's, it's important that we learn to, uh, it it starts with us. It starts at a small level. We, we really got to eradicate the the barriers between us before we can start communicating as a whole with a, a higher, with a higher species, right? Yes, that's correct. I mean, one of the modalities they use, they all speak using telepathic communication. They don't use verbal. Well, if you speak to somebody in our culture and say you're able to speak to higher conscious beings using telepathic communication, they'll think you're uh, you know, a bit bonkers or a lunatic. But uh, clearly they've educated me all my life in relation to telepathic communication. And to me, it's no different from speaking verbally. Uh, when uh, Because every time I was given some telepathic information, uh, I could give you a quick example, 
they gave me telepathic information about the quantum unified field a few years ago, which I knew nothing about. And uh, uh, I'm sat there and thinking, well, you've just given me all this information in a download using frequencies, as you say, Adam. So I need confirmation for that. So I say to them back telepathically, you've given me all this information now. I need some confirmation. Can you show me a craft to prove this information has come from you? And the craft appeared immediately. I went inside to get my wife and said, uh, Sam, come outside, there's a craft here. She came out, she witnessed the craft. We went outside the pool cage area and the second craft, third, four, five, seven craft appeared to in total, flew silently over our heads, changed direction by about 80 degrees uh, and then disappeared sequentially as they had arrived. So that was a confirmation, not only of the information that they'd given me, but the telepathic communication that we, we are able to develop as a species. And as you say, Adam, if we are going to communicate with them, we need to communicate with them at their level. So, uh, and if you do that throughout your life, every time you get telepathic communication, ask for confirmation, the confirmation comes, it reinforces your understanding and ability and confidence in using and communicating with them telepathically. I agree. You know, I'm glad we're talking. Um... A lot of what you're saying that it computes to me because it, when you think about it, the human brain is right now on earth. And I say this a lot, the most complex computer on our planet. Um, it definitely has the ability to have receptors. So the idea of telepathic communication is not, it, it's not far fetched. I mean, our, we have three letter acronyms, both in the United States and the UK where they experiment with these programs to find out more about it with psychics Um Every human brain is basically the same thing. We all have the same computer. It's the different uh, software that we have that allows us to perceive or or, or acknowledge, uh, like psychics. I think some psychics, they just have, you know, the same brain. They have different software. They're allowed to upload, download information uh, that some people can't. And then there's the other part of people where uh, there's a, you know, like a, the religious bias. Like, you can't believe that way. It's against God, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you, you have to be more open-minded to, to allow yourself to have these, to perceive these things, to allow yourself to, like you said, to be educated further than what we know now. We're not, evolution has a lot to do with, with um, education, right? As, as when we were a primitive species and we're, we're running around sticks and hunting and gathering, we later discover how to use tools and make fire. And then we evolved to make that work for us. We cook our food so we could digest it better, et cetera. So it, it's, it's, Humanity's got to start learning again to break down barriers. I think something like with uh, Neuralink, right? Eventually, we're going to have chips in our brain, Kevin. It's coming. You know, our social media, our our, our entertainment's going to be in a chip in our brain, and we're going to be able to communicate without words. And at that point, I think that's when race, race, and relig all those things won't matter anymore. Because now you're there's an understanding. You're seeing the person for who they really are versus what their complexion speaks to. Yes, I, I would agree with you there, Adam. It's a form of trans, transhumanism. But we're already there. Elon Musk has just developed a, a chip that implants in monkey brains at the moment. And then that monkey, via the chip, is able to move a cursor on a computer telepathically. So we're already there. Right. And he's now applied to uh, the FDA, I believe, to get permission to implant that chip into a human being. And he's already got volunteers. You won't get me to volunteer him, but uh, I don't need it because I've already got the telepathic communication. But people are ready to volunteer to do that. So we're on the cusp of that already. And I believe that we'll, uh, there'll be a, a fork in the road, really. We'll go down one transhumanism where we've become more cyborg, we've got implants, and then we'll go down the other side, which will be more like myself, who developed all the, the telepathic communications and the different modalities of contact in relation to higher conscious beings. So, uh, and hopefully the two will run probably side by side and then one will probably peter out uh, as we have done in the past with our evolution. We have different types of species of men or human in the past with two or three branches and then one fades out and the other one keeps going. And it's really, it's just a, another source of evolution that's happening now. Only we're going down, let's say, the cyborg side, the implant side, the augmentation side, uh, are the spiritual side the, developing the abilities of healing, uh, education, telepathic communication, empathy, uh, and all that side that's been denied us uh, for uh, decades, really, and this is where we're at now. So we're at another juncture 
and we'll it'll be very interesting to see which way it goes. Agreed. What? So let me ask: What what are some of the pros and cons of of uh, your communication with these entities? The pros and cons: uh, If I need any help, if I need any advice, I can just ask them telepathically. Uh, I, all my life, I've interacted with them as you would interact with your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents. If you needed something, you needed some help from your grandparents, you would contact them and ask them for some assistance. Well, I've done that uh, with my ET, uh, uh, higher conscious beings. And the other thing that, because I've got the telepathic communication, I have a friend of mine who's a retired detective, Mash, from uh, the UK. And he never believed in ETs, UFOs, higher conscious beings, or anything. He's a, a black and white man, as it were, that uh, he, what, he needs the evidence to see it. A good friend of mine, he comes over a couple of times a year, stays with us. We worked together for many years. And uh, uh, one evening, we were sat there, it was only a couple of years ago, we were sat out by my pool. I have a pool here in Florida, because most people do. And uh, we were sat by the pool, and I asked him if he wanted a beer. A silly question, really, because he likes his beer. So uh, I went inside to get a couple of beers, and uh, I reached in the fridge. As I reached in the fridge, I said telepathically to my each team hides. now will be a good time to show him a craft i got the beers i shut the fridge door went back out to the pool area he was sat with his wife i was sat with sandy my wife as soon as i put the beers down and sat down the craft appeared the the craft flew across the back of our property uh it was only below tree height it did maneuvers that our craft can't do and it's only about 500 feet away it changed his whole perception of reality Something is denied all his life. It just doesn't exist until he saw the uh, UFO itself. And now he's interested in it. changes his, his reality, really, shall we say. I mean, because he's got more information, he's seen them. And then on another occasion, he came, he was sleeping in the uh, uh, front uh, spare bedroom we have, and this bright light appeared outside the uh, bedroom window. And he swears to this day that it, it was a craft. It was there, didn't have any communication other than the bright light in the middle of the night that lit up the bedroom. So uh, I use my telepathic abilities to assist him with his learning. And now he's interested, he watches all the programs. He'll send me information. Kevin, have you seen this? Have you seen that? This is interesting. Uh, in fact, he's coming over again in February. So uh, I'm sure we'll, there's always some activity when he comes over now. So, yeah, so that's a very simplistic way of using it, but that's what I do. Yeah, you know, it's funny. There's a, a scientist. I'm begging to get him on the show. I'd spoken to this guy over a year ago. Uh, I found him because he was doing research in ufology. Um, he has no, 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 he hasn't published anything, no public studies. He's just, at the end of the day, he was trying to prove to his grandson that they're not real. And he, right. I, I'm not going to say the science he worked in. I'm not supposed to even mention his name, so I'm not. But when he retires, I've told him, said, you got to come on and talk about this. He, so long story short, he went out into uh, an area that's considerably a hot spot. He brought very sophisticated equipment with him. And whatever he saw, it altered him completely. It, it made him rethink his religion. It made him rethink how humans behave. It made the science, forget it. When he observed that, his takeaway from it is he was, he was profoundly upset that we aren't even there yet, what he's witnessed. And he, this is a man who, who lived by studying the cutting edge of science. And when you see something like that, it's the major impact on him was why, why do we not study these closely and why do we not try to replicate this? Well, yes, I would agree. And, uh, but we are now, there are many people speaking out. Uh, I mean, I didn't speak out because uh, I just accepted it as part of who I was. And uh, as I say, our culture doesn't allow you to speak out about it. Uh, otherwise you get labeled with all sorts of different labels. So, uh, and if Orton D hadn't have materialized in the bedroom five years ago, I wouldn't have spoken out about it. I wouldn't have written the book uh, or the second book I'm writing at the moment. But clearly, they've educated me through my whole life and uh, never asked me for anything. And they've shown show me some fascinating things. So now it's the time to uh, pay back a little bit to help them with what they're wanting to achieve. Right. So are there any cons to this that you don't? Any what, sorry? Any, are there any cons that's like any negative uh, impact on your life from it? I haven't, no. I, I have heard of others that have had negative in, impact. All mine has been positive. All mine has been educational. And uh, But again, the thread through the education 
is one of consciousness, shared consciousness. And again, I'll say it again, how it can be used for uh, communication, for travel, for healing, for education, for creation and co-creation. And once we realize that, uh, then we will change as a species. Agreed. Agreed deeply. So, you, you know, a big part of what we need to do is, as humans, uh, and I say this a lot, um, if you want a race, try the human race. If you want to title yourself with a religion, humanity. If you want a place of origin, Earth sounds pretty fair to me. You know, like we need to realize we live on this this ball floating through space together, and it's precious. And we're on borrowed yes. time as far as being able to become interplanetary and do greater things for our species. We're very fixed on. Um, I'm guilty of it. I, I own. I, I love Nike. Right. So to me, that's an identity for me. I wear a lot of Nike stuff, you know, so it's going to be t people like Elon. And I said this before, when we're going to Mars to quote unquote terraform it and build a community there on the application, you're not going to see the little box asking your race or religion or political standing. None of that will apply to that. It's only gonna, the only thing on that application is what can you contribute to the terraform of this planet? And we have to do it together. N the race won't matter there. Religion currency won't even matter there. So we we have a we have a big road ahead of us if we're gonna if we're gonna achieve what our observers what our visitors are, have already achieved probably thousands of, for thousands of years we have some significant changing to do and uh, it's I'm hoping it comes sooner than later. Yes, I, I would agree exactly with what you're saying there, Adam. Yeah, and uh, they are here. Well, the ETs are thought so. to call them high conscious beings are here to assist with our evolution. That's what they tell me. Uh, so, and we are a varied species. We we all we're so diverse, uh, so uh, different. Like you say, different religions, uh, different education levels, uh, different cultures, uh, and that's great. You know, uh, the more the merrier, really. But so if we can expand together that knowledge together, and all we really need is globally to see these craft, everybody to see them at the same time, all throughout the globe. And look what happened to my friend. It changed his perception of his reality, and that's what will happen. Our perception will change of our reality because the, the reality is being changed by the education, by just seeing a craft that's flying in the atmosphere, uh, and that's very simplistic. Once we meet the uh, uh, higher conscious beings, the ETs, in the uh, physical form, that will change it exponentially again. So I will say that it's exciting times ahead for our species for humanity and uh, uh i say uh, i just hope i'm i live long enough to see it all unfold i, I think you will i think it's coming sooner you think uh, you know we have billionaires going to space now right it's a, it's a competition between the uh, the rich guys and you know some of them are even talking about making cruises where you know obviously people could pay money to take a cruise around the moon eventually i mean i think within the next decade we learn threefold what we would have learned over 70 years. I think that's coming. Um, I th that's I think that's why the government's stepping up so much to, I guess, disclose. I, I think the government, I said this to David Marler, um, they need to get rid of that word disclose and start using the word acknowledge, right? Acknowledge what's here. I'm not asking the government to give us all their secrets. We know that's not going to happen. But at the very least, acknowledge it publicly with, you know, more figures at the at the helm of it. So, professionals and other people that bear witness or have a message can come out, come forward. Like for you and people like you, I, I thought about this for a while now. Cause I, I personally have witnessed nothing right in my entire life. It's my curiosity is my drive to do this. But I think you and many others, I had to do in the back of my mind. So if humanity eventually goes to space, we're, we're interplanetary. We've, we've finally learned a way to travel space time as our, our visitors are doing we stumble across a planet and on this planet is another primitive race. And they're literally like us, let's say they're bronze age and they're going to war with swords and knives over some weird ideology that they invented. We would say, well, we're going to study them, but in order for us to, to one day, maybe come down there and communicate and teach them better. It's going to start with putting little implants out there. People with information that can slowly put the information out there and convey a message to hopefully Take it from where, because imagine, imagine you publicly speaking about your experiences in the 17th century. You'd be boiled, you know, they would boil you. So it would take time and, and the, you can't speed up the evolution of a species overnight. We know that's not going to happen, but with people like you and others, 
gradually that message gets out there and conveyed and eventually it gets acknowledged by by the powers that be. And then sooner or later, it's just widely accepted. And that's when we take that next step to perhaps maybe, you know, find our own primitive life somewhere, which I really believe in my heart. There's a lot of planets out there where the life forms are, they're maybe similar, maybe not similar, but they're in a stone age or they're in a bronze age or they're just equivalent to us. They're, they exist. It, it would be, what is it? A hundred thousand years for a radio wave across the, the, the Milky Way, let alone other galaxies. There's got to be life out there that's primitive, but for right now, what we know of that's here, that's observing us, that, that you're encountering. They're, yeah, they're, without a doubt. And, uh, would we not say we were an advanced species and we were traveling and we found another Earth? Wouldn't we colonize it? Wouldn't we? And then maybe leave the colony there and disappear and leave it to its own devices and uh, and then come back, you know, a thousand years later and see where that colony is. Uh, yeah, went to how it how it evolved, and but again, keep an eye on it, and uh, you know, assist it, and uh, just you know, help it on. Because well, that, I think that as a human being, that's what we do. We do care about our our uh, the other humans on our planet, and you're correct. In you know, we're flying through space at a tremendous speed, and we're all going together. It's like we're already on a spaceship, it's spaceship Earth. So we need to look after it. We need to. Uh, make sure it stays healthy so we can stay healthy and continue evolving as a species up to the level where the higher conscious beings are. Or, or the couple of the, the guys that I am in contact with uh, get to their level of technology. And clearly, like you say, there we are primitive compared with them, with our technology uh, and our physical understanding of uh, consciousness. Uh, but as we grow and expand that knowledge, then we will develop those higher levels of consciousness. And that's really the importance of sharing the information. Because once you bring something into that consciousness, which I did with my friend, his consciousness and his reality changes. Yep. And it's changed through an experience. And if we can do that globally, then uh, we will uh, evolve exponentially as a species. With all the technologies that we have now, I, I suspect we've a lot more technology that's hidden that is not being re released at the moment. But you're correct with the government. The government are re releasing more information now. Uh, I think the government, so uh, there's so many different departments within the governments that have got their own interests, that there are those that want to have the full disclosure and those that want to keep it quiet because they don't want the ET sharing their uh, technologies with us. And, uh, it's so a good scapegoat, it, right? Because when there's when our governments want to test their their quote unquote black projects, what better scapegoat than UFOs? You know, like well, yeah, it was a UFO, and that's why they let it linger. But at the end of the day, what we're seeing, what David Fravor saw, what a lot of our military is uh, witnessing, you, it's no, there's no denying they're real, they're here, they're present. Um, it, it's oh, without the doubt, Adam. I mean, there's enough evidence now out there. Uh, for anybody to, it's always getting debunked on. There's always the skeptics because there has to be, right. because a lot of people are fearful of change. They're comfortable in their reality where it is and they don't want to change. But uh, I think that uh, it is changing and it changes through consciousness itself. Now, a collective consciousness, when you can get a group of, say, 100 people in the room and only one person talks about ETs and higher conscious beings, then, you know, he's 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 looked upon as somebody that's a bit delusional or whatever. But then if you get the other way, you've got 99 people in the room all having experiences, all seeing these things, then it's just the 1% who, who is the delusional one because of the 99% have seen everything and the, the learning what's happening so that we grow as a group, it's a collective consciousness. I agree. And it's, I mean, when, when we speak collective consciousness, think about how many inventions around in, in time in on planet earth were invented simultaneously in one country to the next country. I, I have to agree. I think there's some sort of upload download status with, uh, with our brains that people have the same kind of ideas or feelings or emotions or, you know, uh, imagination. So for you, you, you uh, it's titled spiritual consciousness, right? Uh, a personal journey. Yeah. So does the spiritual, What's the spiritual effect for you? Because I hear it from a lot. I hear from a lot of people. Their spirituality changes. They, they become more spiritual after meeting this. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question, Adam. Uh, the spiritual side will be 
the uh, my understanding of it is I have a physical body which is here now uh, in Florida. Uh, I'm talking to you via uh, technologies, which is marvelous. Uh, but also within me is the spiritual side of me. Some may say it's the soul. And the soul comes down into the physical body to uh, experience being in physical because the soul is one of the highest vibrational frequencies and to for the soul itself to learn it needs to come down into a, a physical and then learn from that physical so uh, the spiritual side to me is uh, as important as the physical but then my understanding is that when my physical actually passes uh, my conscious energy will uh, revert back to the high levels of consciousness without the physical and if i choose to come back within a physical uh, i can do that uh, and uh, i think if we learn that as a species that we're really uh, both physical and spiritual uh, then we will grow again in relation to our spirituality that's the brilliance of the title of your book I like the, the title, uh, spiritual conscious, a personal journey. So if you think about for me, it is, so I've, you know, I've, I've looked into, uh, afterlife. I've looked into the paranormal ufology on the show. I talk with cops about, I talk about a wide variety of stuff. What I'm at the end of the day, what I think I've learned is that our consciousness and our soul are the same thing. It's raw energy and our bodies are the avatar. We're, we're the machine that, that houses this, this download of energy into our body. And when the machine expires, the energy then goes back to a source, like a, a main a, a main source. And just depending on what you've done here, uh, you could either be recycled, put back here again, because you you know your purpose is needed, and or your energy goes to the next plane, uh, depending on where your energy is needed. Um, that's why I like hearing about it, uh, the idea of it being a spiritual uh, awakening because your consciousness and your soul being the same thing, it, we're all the yeah, same. I, I would agree with the understanding of, of what you're saying there. Adam. I know when I was um, eight years old, I haven't told her that uh, the R&D, the, uh, there was a change. I was taking a bath at home and there was a change in the vibrational frequency within the bathroom. I looked to my right and R&D, as I now know, that materialized in the bathroom. Frightened me to death at the time, as you can imagine, being an eight-year-old. I uh, They were speaking telepathically to one another, which I could understand. And uh, uh, Dee said to Art, is this the boy? And uh, he said, yes, this is the boy. And uh, and then she questioned him again. She said, are you sure this is the boy? Look at him. He's, he's small. He's uneducated. He's frightened by our presence. And she was correct. I was terrified. He said, yes, this is the boy. I will guide him. I will teach him. And he's been in the guide, the main inch, although there have been others, uh, but he's just taught me uh, about consciousness and uh, all the how we're all connected to the plants, the trees, the animals, and as you say, to source energy, source consciousness. The universe itself is conscious, and we are having a physical experience within that conscious energy. And then, as I said again, if we learn to use conscious energy, and very interested. How you mentioned about the inventions there's always two inventions or two inventors or two scientists all going along the same path at the same time and you can see this throughout history and then one one will adopt the particular side of the science that they wanted to do where does that information come from where do those thoughts come from when two people get in almost identical thoughts uh, i suspect from source energy itself it is always there and that's the source of the telepathic communication is just conscious energy, the conduit for the communication. We don't need wires. We look at the communication we have between our computers now. Right. And uh, a different form of energy, but it's an energy. And if you uh, understand that uh, consciousness itself is energy and it has uh, frequencies, frequencies of light at the subatomic level, uh, as our uh, quantum unified field theory scientists will explain to you. And uh, once we know that, it alters who we are uh, as a species and how we can develop further technologies, which we are doing at the moment. As I say, I've already mentioned that Elon Musk and his uh, chip implants in the monkey brains. And there must be a lot more along those lines. So we are now, and we've only, how long have we had all these technologies? 100 years, 200 years, 100 years or so. Blink of an eye. <laughs> 
look how far we've come since the 1900s to where we are now. I mean, it's tremendous. So what are we going to be like in 500 years time, a thousand years time? We're going to be like the higher conscious beings that I'm in contact with now. They've probably gone through this stage of evolution. And that's why uh, we we are here. I know when I told my mother that the, well, I, I didn't get out of the bath, I was so frightened, the water went cold. She came in to see why I was still in the bath. And I said that about the two beings. And she said it was just my imagination. And uh, clearly it wasn't. But that was the uh, culture at the time. If you saw anything out of the novel or the novelties, then it's just your imagination. Well, clearly it, it's not. It, in my case, it was that they were real and they are still real to the day. I agree. You know, it, it, what we've done with technology in 100 years, 120 years, it, is it, it's mind-boggling. I mean, our, our cell phone in just a decade, the, the technology there, the evolution of a cell phone in a decade, that's crazy. Computers. Do you know... I, it was funny to me is that um, I was looking at an old computer I had and it was like, you know, I marveled at it. It was a tablet. I was like, wow, look how amazing this is. And now everyone has a tablet in their pocket, everybody, you know? And so when you think about that, I, I watched this show on, on a history channel. Uh, it is called, the uh, it's like ancient uh, technologies or something. So anyway, on this show, I'm learning about the ancient Greeks and I'm learning about the, the ancient Egyptians and some of the inventions. I'm like, wow, what happened to these these amazing writings and technologies and, and all these inventions? And then I found out uh, Rome marched in with Catholicism. And, uh, you know, obviously the guy with the cape on is in charge. We're 2,000 years behind on technology because of, you know, repression of religion. And I'm not bashing religion. I'm just saying if you really look at how that... We, they marched into Alexandria and they, they took over the library and uh, inventions were not of God, et cetera, et cetera. So we're finally to a point now in the 19th century, start making inventions. And like you said, in the last hundred years is amazing. And in, I would say in a thousand years, yeah, I think, I think you're right. We are definitely, if we don't, if we don't self-destruct, we're going to be in a pretty amazing place. Well, my, my ET guides, which I refer to the as. Uh, they tell me that we've reached this level of uh, technology in the past and destroyed ourselves. And we're, we're on the verge of doing it again. Perhaps we've got to get through that stage of technology so we can continue further. And you, you mentioned watching something on the TV. I've just been watching that uh, ancient apocalypse with Graham, uh, ooh, I've lost name now. Uh, and uh, he, he was talking about the old technologies that we had thousands of years ago, going back 10,000, 12,000 years so we may well have uh, developed those technologies all those thousands of years ago. And then uh, Graham Hancock, that was the name I was Yeah, Graham Han I and, like uh, him. I'm a huge yeah, fan uh, of Graham Hancock. If you, watch, if you haven't watched the series, it's excellent. Uh, he, he lays it out quite clearly uh, with all the technology. He doesn't have all the answers, but he's just promoting the facts and things that he's discovered. And again, uh, you know, it, it, most things that step out of the science of understanding it gets poo pooed, and it's like they don't, they purposely don't want us to learn about these things or learn about our history, our galactic history. Are we seeded here? I don't know. I suspect possibly we were seeded here, seeded here, and then nurtured. And uh, part of this nurturing is continuing to educate people like myself and others. I'm not alone now, Adam. I know I never spoke out about it before, and uh, but now I've been speaking out about it. There's many people who've got the contact with. Uh, many different beings, many different species. Uh, so it's becoming, I won't say more common, but my circle of friends now, uh, a lot are experienced contactees. Uh, I don't know how you want to describe us, but uh, uh, there are many now speaking out. So we, we are changing our understanding, we're changing our consciousness, we're creating that new reality using thought and consciousness. That's what we're doing. I agree. I, I even religion stepping up. You know the uh, the the Vatican now. I, I didn't notice they own a lot of different uh, space uh, observations, uh, telescopes, and they have scientists looking into this. And, and their their answer is going to be that they think they're going to baptize them. Right? <laughs> they're under <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> at least they're uh, open-minded to the fact that. Uh... Uh, and I have no problems with religions. I think they have a, a, a great purpose for humanity. So, but it's but they have to grow with uh, humanity 
as humanity grows. And I, I did see something where the Vatican said that they would um, take people in, uh, are they high conscious beings, the ETs, into the church, they could join the church if they wanted, they'd even baptize them. So, you know, it's that open-mindedness, and because they're speaking about it, uh, that will filter down to the congregations and things, and uh, uh, that's where we need to go. We need these leaders who lead the, these different groups, the different religions, and the, I mean, most of the Eastern religions, they all embrace all this stuff. It's a Western philosophy that separated when we went down the scientific route of materialism, uh, and that's where we're at now. So we really need to gain that spiritual consciousness back into who we are, uh, and then expand from there. So for, for someone like me, uh, it, um, I don't know if you listened to the episode with Kathleen Martin. That's who introduced me to you, by the way. Kathleen Martin, love her. Um, yes, I, I know Kathleen. She's a good friend. Yeah, I'd, with her, I'd spoken about, you know, like a dream I had. And I think it's because I was looking so deeply into the, the abduction series. I was looking so deeply into the contact series that I had a dream. I'll, I'll let you listen to that episode to get the description of it. But what I'm asking is, um, for me, or people like me that have never witnessed anything, is there a, a way we could, like, I don't know, like establish contact and or a way to, to for me to physically go find and see one? Oh, yes, without a doubt. Without, and dreams are a modality of contact. Um, so dreams are used very often with uh, information, but you only have to, you have to realize that and then act upon it. Uh, but yeah, certainly dreams are a, a, one of the modalities of contact because what they're really doing is using consciousness while you're asleep to give you the dream and information. I've been given information while I've been asleep, but then I wake up. I've even been, I've been asleep. And they've even woke me up. Though on one occasion they woke me up, at, it was February the first at one 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 a.m. Very often they use synchronicity numbers for that confirmation. They then gave me a telepathic communication. I got walk, got out of bed, walked into my uh, bathroom, and from my bathroom window I can see a street light. So I repeated the message back to them, and I said, "If this message has come from you, can you confirm it by uh, turning that street light off?" And the street light went off immediately. You know, that was confirmation one. I went back to bed. I woke up at uh, eight o'clock in the morning. It was daylight. They gave me a second. They actually woke me up by jumping physically on the bed. I didn't see them, but I felt two people jump on the bed physically. Uh, I woke up. They gave me the second part of the message, which was telepathic again in nature. I walked into my bedroom, bearing in mind it's uh, into my bathroom, bearing in mind it's now daylight. I repeated the first part and the second part of the message and said, can you confirm this information has come from you by turning the street light on? And the street light came on immediately. So that was confirmation on that particular uh, uh, communication. And once we realize that, once you realize that your dreams are uh, part of that communication, and there are, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Costa McCreese, but he has the ET Let's Talk uh, group. And there's uh, over a million people go out uh, once a month into their backyards and ask the ETs to show themselves. And the craft appear, uh, and that's a, a regular event. You know, anybody can look uh, Costa up, they can uh, uh, go onto his, his website, is etletstalk.com. You can join, put in your location, and create a, uh, your own, what they call, C5 group where people go outside into their yard at night with a small group of people and ask the ETs to show themselves. And they do. So uh, it's open to us. We have to be open-minded to doing it. And as I say, I, I think Costa's been doing this for 13 years. And um, so he's got his own contact. Um, so, yeah, there's many people out there that are working towards this. So, yes, Adam, go out there. Join your local CE5 group. I'm sure there'll be, oh, there's one in Tampa. Uh, Mike Merberg at, at Derby Ranch get in touch with Mike Merberg go down there and uh, uh, join his C5 group hey, I'm sure he'll welcome you with open arms yeah trust me I will because I'm one of, you know I'm going to do a documentary eventually um, and I'm a I have a different approach uh, I'm probably going to get in trouble in some case because I run at stuff if I see something I'm going to run at it right I have to hypothetically so when I do travel I'm going to travel the country and every spot I go to you know the the three big ones uh, ghosts UFOs Bigfoot or whatever it is if I see a Bigfoot I got to run at that 
I gotta grab it. It might be to to my demise, but I gotta. I it's not good enough for me to get documented well. Um, everything I do for this show and in documentary is not for the purpose of just great, you know, wide education. It's to satisfy curiosity. It's been my whole life. And I'm one of these people, even as a kid, as a child, I would look up at space and know there's no shot. We're the only life form here. Uh, I would, I would not, I, it's not that I would question everything. Cause you know, I grew up in a Catholic home and when you grow up in a Catholic home and you, the Bible's preached to you pretty often, and you start hearing these stories like, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's not good enough for me to think that we were made here. This is it. And that's all there is to it. When you see the vastness of space, the first time I learned about uh, space as a kid, I felt pretty small. And even as an adult, when I learned about what we're learning now, what we learn about space and galaxies and black holes, it's ridiculous how insignificant as an individual we, I am or we are, you know. And it makes you appreciate really what you have directly around you near the exact 360. So for, let me ask you this. Would, um, if someday you decide to document your, your visitors and, and some of the sightings, you know, with either film or however, would they be opposed to that? So just ask that question again. I didn't fully understand what you said, Adam. If, if like you decide you want to uh, document your, your visitors and some of the craft you see, would they, would they be okay with it? Or is that something you're allowed to do? Well, that's a very good question. I can give you an example of a craft appearing that my wife took a photograph of. I was, I uh, uh, can't remember the date now, but it'd be in my notes somewhere. I was uh, in the uh, bedroom. I was just getting up and I routine in the morning my wife gets up first, she feeds the dogs, and then she goes out onto the pool area and has a, a cup of tea. I get up and uh, uh, and then I make a cup of coffee and go and join her on the pool deck. We sit chatting for an hour or so before we start our day. And on this occasion, I thought I'll see if I can get in contact with the group of eight DTs that I've been lifelong contact with uh, using telepathy. And I wasn't able to make contact with them, but I contacted a small craft that was flying past. And when I get the telepathic communication, with that telepathic communication, I see where they are and what they're doing. And it was a small craft uh, with about seven or eight greys in it. And the pilot was a grey. And I'd met him before. His name was Tia. I asked him what he was doing here, where I lived. And he said they were uh, close by. They deviated from their flight path to, um, to see where I lived. So I had some other conversation. Then he said, right, we'll have to go because... As I said, we're off our designated flight path. So I left, I said goodbye. And uh, nothing unusual for me. But then I got up, I made my cup of coffee, I went out to the pool area, and uh, my wife said, oh, you missed the most beautiful rainbow this morning. I said, oh, were you able to get a photograph? She said, yes. And I have five acres, and the rainbow was 180 degrees from fence line to fence line. And then she said, you'll never guess what happened next. I said, what happened next? She said, the... Uh, uh, craft appeared under the rainbow and the rainbow as i say was 180 degrees about 500 feet from where we live and i said did you get a photograph she said yes i did now with all these photographs it's a little blurred but what was interesting with the photograph is the uh, the time on the uh, clock in the bedroom was 8 30. the time on the photograph i thought was 8 30 but my wife corrected me the other day so i said it was 8 30. It was 8.32. But it was still the time when I was speaking to Tia. So what happened? They materialized a craft at the time I was speaking to the pilot for confirmation uh, a, of the telepathic communication and the fact that we're here and the fact that they show a craft to my wife. So that's one occasion. A craft appeared when I asked them to show it for my friend Marsh. Then I was at a conference once and uh, someone came up and said, Kevin, would you have a ET show us a craft? I said, I, said, I don't know. He said, well, will he ask? ask them? And I said, yes, I'll ask them. So, uh, but he also asked two other people who have contact with their own uh, ETs, high conscious being. And so the three of us asked. Uh, about a minute after we asked, a craft appeared. Uh, we were outside at the conference, and it was there for one hour, 20 minutes. So we are able to call the craft in, um, and that seemed to be more and more common. There's a guy in, I think, California now, Robert Bingham, He's been doing it for years. He used to uh, uh, go into the New York uh, Soul Park 
and uh, just call it the the craft in and, and come in and people will go out and see them. But I saw something recently about him. I haven't seen him for a long while. And he moved. He was in California. And whether he's doing the same thing or not. So they do answer to our telepathic communication. Uh, they will. I've got a friend here that lives in Ocala. He has a C5 once a month. He goes out. Uh, and in fact, I went up to this group a couple of months ago. And uh, the craft appeared. And they actually had uh, uh, people being touched by the beings. Physical touching. So it's getting... Um, uh, more and more popular, they're expanding the experiences of people. So yeah, I would just say, suggest to you, Adam, go out there and uh, explore, see what's out there, and ask. You know, I'll ask them to come uh, and show themselves behind our home, and they'll come all the way up to the uh, pool cage uh, down right above us, and, uh, just for confirmation that they're they're out and about. As it were. I'm going to have to try because I, it, for me, that's what I need. It's not that, look, I undoubtedly know UFOs are real. Undoubtedly, I know that there's life out there. Undoubtedly, we're being monitored and, and observed. But I just, you know, it's like uh, it's it's like the kid that goes to the the, the zoo and they have the, the lion exhibit and the lions don't come out. It's like, damn it, I want to see the lions, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, for you, it's, it's another thing for people. Uh, especially when you start reading and researching uh, and the not propulsion, but the ability for these craft to utilize space time for travel uh, to summon them and have them come to you is not impossible. They're not using energy the same way we are. You know, when you learn about two atoms simultaneously, uh, they could, they, they interact from across just the vastness of space in, you know, simultaneously, instantly. Um, when, you know, I look at the cosmic web, I remember the first time I observed this, the first time I looked at it, and I thought to myself, this is like fiber optic cables connecting the entire universe, uh, all this dark matter. If you really utilize just energy itself, there's nowhere you can't get to instantly until, you know, especially when we're separated from our physical being, right? The energy that we house within our, our avatar, that could basically go anywhere, our consciousness slash our soul. So I'm excited to learn more about it. Uh, your next yeah, book... No, no. Go ahead. So go. I was going to ask about your next book. What's the what's the title of your next book coming out? I haven't decided on the title yet. I've got all the information together. I've just got to sort of edit, final edit, and then uh, uh, write a forward for it, and then so I've got to think about a title. But it'll be uh, some more experiences that I've had, and then uh, you mentioned Kathleen Martin earlier. Uh, we uh, I met Kathleen by I was asked by my ET guys to go to a conference a MUFON conference in Orlando a few years ago. And I didn't really want to go. I wasn't particularly interested in the nuts and bolts and everything. And uh, But they asked me to go, so I went. And on the way down there, I remember saying to Art, I said, look, I'm going all the way down here for the day. I hope I can meet someone that will help me on my journey. And uh, I went to the conference. I was surprised by the caliber of people that were there, the engineers, scientists, doctors, uh, and it was full about six, 700 people. And I listened to the morning's uh, uh, presenters and uh, Kathleen Marden was one of the doing the presenting. I didn't know her at that time. I knew of her, but I didn't know her. And then lunchtime came and I thought, I'll go to the cafeteria and get a sandwich. I walked down to the cafeteria and it was full. There wasn't a seat anyway. I bought a sandwich and then I saw a, a small seat uh, next to two ladies on the table, just the one seat that was vacant. So I went up, I said, do you mind if I sit down and eat my sandwich here? They said, no. They continued with the conversation. Then when they'd finished, they brought me into their conversation. One of those people was Dr. Melanie Barton. Hmm. She was the person I was there to meet. I didn't know that. Uh, I was guided to go down there to do that. From there, I met uh, Denise Stoner, and then uh, uh, I was introduced to uh, Kathleen Marden. And then from there, we met at our house, my home, uh, once a month for over two years, and I was channeling information coming direct from the group of eight ET guides that I'm in contact with, which was, it was a shock to me when it first happened. It wasn't something I was interested in. Uh, but so I'm going to include those uh, uh, transcripts in the new book. Uh, Kathleen covered some of them in her latest book, The Forbidden Knowledge. So if people are interested, I think there's 120 questions in there that we asked and the answers from the uh, higher conscious beings, from the ETs. So uh, if you're interested in getting into that information, 
They'll say that's forbidden knowledge by Kathleen Mahadon. And it's no coincidence that I've come all the way over to Florida and Kathleen lives about five minutes from where I do. Yeah, you and Kathleen are not far from me, you know. So (laughs) the next uh, convention coming up, I'm going to start attending. I need to. I I need to have a little responsibility, like I said. If I'm going to investigate and research, uh, I have an obligation to go be hands-on. This last year, I more was absorbing information, right? Uh, Gathering information. I form my own opinions and theories, and uh, I'm going to become more investigative over the course of the next year. I, that's that, you know, again, I'm, it's re- I, ha- I have a responsibility to do so. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for more of it. I, I like meeting people like you because it expands on what, uh, what I thought I've already done. Just talking today has, you know, I've evolved some of the ways I'm thinking already in the small right, conversation okay. we had. And if you, you know, it's obviously seem interest in the fact that the spiritual side and the physical side, when I was uh, nine years old, I uh, there was a, an orb that appeared in, in my home. I'd had some friends around Sunday afternoon, it was. We'd been playing, and then it was time to go home for tea. So I, sh- I showed them out the back door, and as I turned around and came back into the home, I could feel that change in the frequency within the home. So I went looking for this source of this energy. I went in the kitchen, upstairs in the bedrooms, came back down to the living room where it was strongest, and I walked towards the window where I could feel the energy. And behind the drapes and curtains was a an orange orb, about four to six inches across, slightly vibrated. Uh, a uh, there wasn't any communication, uh, and I thought, well, it, it'll disappear by the time I go to bed this evening. I went to bed. I woke up the following morning, and I could tell it was still in the room. I went downstairs, moved the curtain, and it was still there. It was there for a whole week. I now know that that uh, conscious energy orb was art one of the beings that had materialized in the bathroom when I was eight years old. But he did something to me, I'm not quite sure what he did, whether he activated some DNA or what. But he was there for a whole week. I came in on the from school on the Friday, I opened the back door and I knew that he'd left. As I say, I wasn't aware of any communication from him. But immediately after that event, I was able to separate my conscious energy from my physical. I could just relax, open my mind, and I would go and travel. This again, using conscious energy as a, a conduit for travel. I would travel over to my grandparents' house, which was 70 miles away in Liverpool. I would enter through the roof and sit down in a chair. I don't know why they need a chair because I'm just conscious energy. But it was uh, in the dressing room upstairs in their master bedroom. I could look down through the floor, floor which was opaque. My grandmother would usually be uh, uh, cooking in the kitchen on a Sunday and my grandfather either watching TV or uh, reading the newspaper. And it gave, gave me great comfort to go over there and just see them. Uh, and I often wondered when I was sitting there, what would they see if they came upstairs? I now know the answer to that. They would have seen an orange, yellowy orb, slightly vibrating four to six inches across, my pure conscious energy. Uh, and I've been able to travel that way all my life. And the ETs, they can travel that way as well by separating that physical from the conscious energy. Now, if you talk about that to most people, it, it's above their comprehension, really. But we are able to do that as a species, as a being, uh, traveling outside of the body, uh, out of body travel, as they call it. And there are many people that have written about it. But I, at that time, as a child, I would just use it to go and visit my grandparents. I didn't realize the full potential. There are no limitations to where you can travel once you're outside of the physical, just as pure conscious energy. Uh, that's where, that's what they do. That's the level of understanding uh, that they have. And that's what they've taught me. And I'm sure there are many others that can do this. You know who else is very, uh, is really behind that and, and uh, they are looking deeper into it is uh, our government, our military. I watched a documentary some years ago, uh, probably like 2014, where they're discussing the idea because uh, they were interviewing people who would um, they would do remote viewing. They were interviewing yeah. psychics, and the idea was for us to utilize some sort of program where we don't need, say, satellites or spy planes. And in this documentary, the scientists are saying the only thing that really prevents humanity from from using our our, our uh, consciousness to go somewhere to make an observation 
is that we're, we're trapped into this vessel, our body. But that's just science saying that. We haven't explored the spiritual part of it, how we can do it. So it's Well, exactly, yeah. And, and again, I would agree with you, uh, uh, Adam, that uh, the uh, remote viewing has, has been used by our government for many years. I think uh, I think it was uh, Russell Targ that uh, uh, started all that. And then the governments realised that, well, there's some truth to this. And anybody can learn to remote view. I have a couple of friends that actually teach it. Uh, there's uh, another friend who was a total sceptic about all this stuff and he went on a course to, learn to remote view and to a surprise, he was able to remote view. So that again, that's using consciousness as a conduit uh, for this travel or seeing while you are uh, outside the physical. And I think there's a slight difference between traveling uh, uh, completely as pure conscious energy outside of the physical body to the remote viewing, but it's linked very closely to that. Right. So, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm able to travel on the astral plane. I've been able to do that from a child and, and I still do it to this day. Very often I will meet with Orton D on the astral plane and very often in the craft, which is conscious that they created through thought and consciousness. Well, these are technologies that, uh, this is again where I was talking earlier about the transhumanism. Are we going to go down the cyborg route? Are we going down the route that I use, that I've developed, which is traveling outside of the physical um, and meeting with higher conscious beings on the astral plane in a conscious craft? I mean, these are science, it's science fiction, really, but it's, it's my reality. It's part of my reality. It's not far off. I mean, I think there's going to be a division. I think eventually people like you are going to utilize the, the gift you have. And then there's going to be that other number of people that utilize technology to, like you said, we're already basically cyborgs. We live with our smartphone. I, I, I try, yes, you know what I did yes. the other day? I, the other day I sat down, I remembered my childhood. I said, what would I do today if I didn't have this phone or a gaming system or a computer? What, what would I do? And then I had to remember as a kid, I'd, I'd always go out and entertain myself. I'd always explore, go play manhunt. And so I try to spend a full day without my phone using it at all or my computer or the gaming console. And it, one hour in, I was absolutely bored. It was, it was I had to force myself to read a book because now today information, when I want to sit down and research, I could just pop up any platform and listen to it in the background while I'm cleaning the house or going on a walk. Um, I become lazy. And now like I have to be a little more, again, more responsible. I got to read more books to absorb information better than it just being some background consciousness, you know, some, some sort of background noise per se. I don't even go to bed without listening to a documentary or, or some form. Right. I'm one of those. I got to constantly pull information in, but yeah. Well, to, I, I think that's a good thing. Right? We're, there's so much information now that's available to us because of the internet. So, and, and our, our brain can absorb as much information as you want to put in there. Uh, so and it's empty at the moment, I think. So we need to we need to fill it up with more information, which is part of the evolution of the internet. But again, that's going like you say, going on the, the side of the. Uh, we've now got the smartphones and all that entails. But if you're a child and you're brought up with a smartphone and you don't know the other side of going out and playing uh, outside with the in the sunshine, you know, seeing all the beautiful trees, the animals, the plants, and everything, then you're missing out, and you're you're probably more inclined to go down that cyborg route because that's what you're used to from being brought up as a child with your own smartphone, all the technology that we do have. So uh, th there is that divergence now, I think. And, well, it'd be very interesting to see which way we, we, we evolve. It might end up being that our evolution goes two different directions, right? The technology goes exploring space with technology and then people like yourself and others like you explore the vast of the universe in instantaneously. As a, as a form of energy, right? I mean, it, it could very yes. well be we divide that way. Yes, I, I would agree. I, um, I consider myself now, uh, uh, the, is termed, which was termed by uh, Dr. Rebecca Harkos Wright, as an exoconscious human. I have those abilities that are exoconscious outside of my physical, this larger exoconscious multidimensional being that we all are. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm glad we spoke. Before we close, again, you're. I'm going to put it in description so people would find it. But name your book and where they could find it. Okay, my book is titled "Spiritual Consciousness: A Personal Journey." 
and it's on Amazon if anybody wants to order it on there. Perfect. All right, oh, for... and I do have a website, Adam. It, uh, yeah. Um, what's it now? Kevin J, just the initial J, kevinjbriggs.com. And if you go on there and scroll down to events and media, I've uploaded some interviews, uh, and I think there's even a channel on there that I put on. And uh, uh, and then people can contact me through there. If they've got any questions, just send me an email. There's a link direct to me. So, And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I'll put the links in description so it makes it easier for people to navigate to. And um, for those okay. of you listening, I'm going to say good night, good day, good evening, or whatever it is for you. And I'm going to talk to Kevin in post. Thank you.